Thanks, Rich, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Whether we are principals, superintendents, teachers, counselors, specialists, parents, or teacher educators, we are all here for the kids. And as we know, when we support our public schools, we support our kids. Amazingly positive things occur in classrooms and school buildings all across the country, although we don't always hear about them. We need to do a better job of shining a light on the successes of our public schools and how they are helping ensure a bright future for our kids. That's why the Learning First Alliance and its members, leading education groups representing over 10 million members, launched the Here for the Kids campaign. The campaign is a critical effort that brings together families, educators, school professionals, and community members to shine a light on our local public schools and share the stories of the great things happening in classrooms and school buildings nationwide. We are here today to hear from local school and district leaders about successful and promising programs and practices that are advancing student learning and well being. Joining us to share personal reflections on how Here for the Kids is demonstrated in their classrooms, school, school district, and community is a group of exemplary leaders from around the country. First is Rebecca Cole. Rebecca is the National Education Association Board Director in Maine and is a teacher at Wyndham Primary School in Maine's Wyndham Raymond School District, a district that is at about 20 minutes from Portland and comprises six schools serving approximately 3,200 students. Next is Don Regelstein. Don serves on the board of the Consortium for School Network, COSIN, and is the Chief Technology Officer for the Maine Township High School District in Illinois. Don's district of three high schools serves approximately 6,200 students. All three schools are comprehensive learning facilities that have been recognized by the U.S. Department of Education as the National Secondary School Recognition Program. Our next pa panelist is Kathy Kajijian. Kathy is the president of the National School Public Relations Association and is the executive director of communications and strategic planning for the Glenview, Illinois Public Schools District 34. Glenview is located in the Chicago suburbs and serves approximately 4,300 students. Kathy was one of our presenters at the launch of the Here for the Kids campaign, where among other things, she spoke of the value of telling student and school success stories. And our final panelist is Laura Mitchell. Laura is with the Montgomery Councils of PT, Montgomery County Council of PTAs, and is the National PTA 2022 Shirley Igo Advocate of the Year Award winner. Laura's school district, Montgomery County, is the largest in Maryland and the 14th largest nationally. It serves 209 schools and more than 160,000 students. Laura also joined us for the Here for the Kids campaign launch. We'll begin our questions with Rebecca. And Rebecca, again, thanks for being here. And I wanna begin by asking, how does your school and classroom work to demonstrate how you are here for the kids? Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here and for the opportunity to come and um, highlight some of the things that we're doing that would support the um, campaign. So uh, I'm going to just refer to my notes here. So I beg your uh, indulgence in that. Uh, some of the things that are happening in my classroom level um, to support the students in our learning communities. Um, one thing that we've just initiated this year is a partnership between my classroom of first graders and the alternative education program at Wyndham High School, 
We have um, students coming from that program to my classroom weekly. They come every Wednesday for about an hour, and we have had them assist us with activities ranging from day-to-day -day academic routines, such as you know guided reading, um, helping with some of their uh, daily classwork, to special projects, STEM and STEAM activities. We're starting to plan some outdoor activities. The Katahdin program is an adventure-based um, therapeutic program for students, and they the kids are really excited to bring some of their learning from that program uh, to their work with my little first graders. Uh, it's it's truly ma been magical um, watching how these two groups of students have fed each other's need for some time and attention and affection and to watch the students from the alternative ed program really take on a leadership role and mentorship role of their younger counterparts has been truly beautiful and they're all so excited um, they have a waiting list of students from that program that want to come down and work with us so that's been really exciting uh, my school does a program called backpackers where we provide um, non-perishable food items weekly to families who request it or who, for, for whom that's been a recommendation uh, made to our leadership and that has been really helpful uh, to get kids through the weekend. Um, we have a lot of families who've expressed a lot of gratitude, just, you know, every little bit helps. And we have a huge volunteer core that helps make sure that that's happening every week. Um, we have family academies in our school. We're um, having one tonight, as a matter of fact, where families can come and do a, a number of activities from you know, how to help with reading at home to um, cooking more healthfully and uh, some games that people can engage in that are not based in electronics. Those have been really successful. And we had been uh, sad to lose that during the pandemic. And it's been wonderful to see that come back and f have families feel welcome to be back in the building and part of a really vibrant um, community on many levels. We have instituted across the district um, levels of summer programming that we weren't able to do um, for a while and even more in a more robust way than, um, than pre-pandemic. And families have really enjoyed having kids have the opportunity for that. The kids have enjoyed staying connected to people they care about and who care about them here at school. Um, we've increased our school counselor support, our social work support. We have um, suites or family services and DHS um, in-house in our building and across our district um, who can provide those family therapeutic services right here in the context of school and follow up if they need to um, outside of the building. Um, we took a lot of time the last couple of years initiating our school year with a real focus on relationships and knowing that the academics is important, but knowing that we can't fulfill those academic needs if kids' basic needs aren't being met. And so making sure that we're helping build community, we're doing lots of activities to build trust and to help kids with social thinking, um, learning social cues, that's been a challenge the last couple of years, just being in school and um, building some stamina for some independence and confidence around their learning um, through meeting their social emotional needs. Uh, we have a rigorous um, foster grandparent program. We have a number of people through uh, Opportunity Alliance who come in uh, many of them daily and are another adult, another point of contact and a, and a person to whom these kids can reach out for just some time and attention and the help that they have offered our classroom teachers is invaluable. Um, we have people who really are stepping up in light of uh, the staff shortages that we know are everywhere and folks really, you know, helping out wherever they can, taking an extra duty, um, absorbing a, you know, a portion of students if someone's co colleague has to be out to take care of um, their own family's needs. Um, it's been really uh, encouraging and inspiring to see everybody stepping up in, in those ways. So um, there's, I mean, myriad things that I'm sure um, a focus on restorative practices has been really key to our success um, and helping students re-engage um, in school since the pandemic, but also using the opportunity of the pandemic to highlight that that is a need that we weren't um, fulfilling um, as vibrantly before as we maybe could and um, taking this as an opportunity to do that. 
Sounds like a lot of positive things you have going on there, again, to demonstrate how you in your classroom and your school are demonstrating uh, how you all are here for the kids. Well, you know, you talked about challenges and the social emotional issues that kids are facing, especially uh, since the pandemic. Uh, what other challenges are, are you seeing that kids are facing now? In the context of my classroom, um, I'm a 27 year veteran classroom teacher. And so just when you think you've seen it all, uh, the world throws you a curveball. Um, but some of the things that I've noticed increasingly over the last um, few years, not just uh, related to uh, COVID, are kids' ability to cope with frustration or not getting something right the first time, um, following social cues and engaging in social thinking, being part of a community. Um, following a classroom routine, which may be very different from what the, for my students for what they experienced in kindergarten and making a transition, um, understanding that certain behaviors may be acceptable in one social context, but not another. Um, they're just exhausted a lot of the time. I think that they spend, even if they're asleep, I think their bodies and brains are still processing, um, making it, you know, navigating their day. And so I see a lot of really tired kids. I've had to really be in, intentional about how we do start to increase our expectations academically um, as they build stamina really to to get through their day and to have it, it, enjoy their day and make school um, a positive place for them. Um, certainly we want to address any of the needs that the pandemic foisted upon us as far as academics and other things but um, again just trying to do what we can to help them feel that they are part of a community, help them understand their responsibility in that. Um, that can be very challenging. Um, helping them learn how to self-advocate. If, if they don't understand something or they don't need something, it can be very hard for them to have the words and the courage to to speak up and say, I, I need this. This is um, not working for me. Um, and just helping them build relationships with each other and with the adults around them who care about them. Um, there's been a lot of focus certainly um, everywhere on making sure that we're, you know, focusing and learning more about kids, social, emotional learning needs and uh, mental health. And I think again, as you know, many challenges as the pandemic brought, I think one thing that it did do was really highlight some inequities um, in our systems. Um, Certainly, as a facilitator for uh, NEA's Leaders for Just Schools program, you know we've been trying to really raise awareness about how some of the things that even are intended to support may, in fact, um, create an inequity um, among the, our learners and their families. So, um, just helping kids be ready to be here, be present, feel that their needs are being met, so that they can do the best learning that they can, and um, and to have find joy and be happy um, as learners. What do you wish you had to help more kids? I've been thinking about that question all weekend, and certainly there are some, um, probably some obvious answers, but I think for me, when I looked at all the different things that I would want for them, it all boils down to the resource of time, which none of us have enough of, right? And so I tried to look at the things that we are doing um, that are helping students and supporting them and putting kids first. And really most of those things offer kids more time. They offer kids more time with an adult or an older person or just a peer who with whom they can build relationships, offers them more time to develop their academic skills, offers them more time through academic supports or the like the mentoring program. Having those Katahdin students here has been such a game changer. One of them said to me at the end of a session, she said, I feel like I didn't do very much. And I said, you have to remember that you only met with three or four students but you met with each of those students for several minutes. And those are minutes that I could not give every kid in this classroom when it's just one of me and 20 of them. And all of those, what probably things to people make such an, an impact in such a positive way. And it's it really just boils down to every kid getting the time to feel seen and be seen and heard and have somebody, you know, take time to, you know, teach them how to tie their shoe or put a Band-Aid on or just listen to their story about this week, the elf on the shelf. Um, <laughs> but they're just craving that. And 
just knowing that somebody's hearing them and is there if they need to tell a story or talk about a problem or express a worry um, or help them, you know, with this little, you know, I'm stuck on this writing piece. I need somebody to just, just sound out this word with me. Um, it just makes such a difference and helping their families have time by, you know, maybe not sending home homework or, you know, sending home things that they can enjoy doing together that are still fostering their learning or providing a family academy night where they can have a really focused time to come together and engage in those activities as a family. Um, so I think, you know, just more time to help kids engage in that. And of course, we want to make sure that we're addressing any um, opportunity interruptions for kids as far as academics has gone the last couple of years. But just making sure that we're also not just, you know, I the term rigor sometimes is a trigger for me because I, I want to, of course, provide a robust educational experience for kids, but um, I want them to feel like, like they're not being rushed through their day or rushed through any experience that they have um, as little people. Rebecca, thanks for sharing the great things you're doing in your classroom and your school for your students and being here for the kids. Thank you very much. Absolutely, my pleasure, thank you. Let's bring in our local leader of technology education, Don Riegelstein. Don, thank you for joining us today. And let's start off by telling us what your school district is doing to demonstrate how you are here for the kids. Okay, um, thank you, first of all, for uh, allowing me the opportunity to be here. Glad to uh, to be a part of this work and to help uh, our schools improve and, and be there for every student. Um, so first of all, our district is really, you know, our superintendent and the district is laser focused on, uh, on career development for students. We really want to make sure that we are addressing not only our students who are going on to college, but we also need to make sure that we're addressing our students that will be going into the workplace and even, you know, potentially providing students the means with which to make some income in order to sort of fund their college education too. To. And, you know, and especially with our student uh, debt crisis that we're seeing now, um, I think this is all important for what we do. Um, so part of what we do as a school district to do there um, is we're focused on an experiential learning, what you know we would normally call college, or I'm sorry, career technical education. Um, so we're we're focused on that. We've got some very very state of the art tools um, that we allow students to use. Um, actually, the students I'm sitting in Maine East High School right now, and the uh, students here actually help build homes uh, for families in a in a neighboring community. So that was really something neat that they could do to A, develop their career skills, but also B, give back to the community. So, so that was a great thing. Um, we do use a tool called School Links, uh, which allows students to get a good preview of what career paths can look like and what, if they choose to go to college afterwards, what their investment will look like for college and how they can get, you know, quote unquote, the best bang for their buck. Out of, out of a college investment. So it really sort of looks at various schools, looks at which schools are really good, what the investments would like really good in terms of what the students wanna do. Um, so, you know, that we're finding that we're in the second year of doing that and uh, we're finding some really, really good results. Um, that tool also help us do scheduling, um, help, you know, suggest courses for kids on their career paths, et cetera. So that's, that's pretty neat. Um, we also uh, do some tech internships, you know, and again, you know, I'm coming at this from a technology lens, um, but we do have students working with us in our tech support uh, areas in each building. So they're getting the opportunity to uh, help support staff, uh, which is really kind of a neat thing. It helps them develop their relationship skills, kind of customer service skills, but also their technical skills at the same time. Um, and that's, you know, as anybody who can tell you that's worked in technology for a while, it's very, very hard to get technology people that are also good at interacting with people. Um, and that's that's fairly key for what we do. Um, we've been we've been really, really uh, blessed as a community by our 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 community actually funded um, through a referendum, some very, very significant 
upgrades to our learning spaces and schools. So we've done a really, really just an amazing job. You know, again, and here at the school that I'm sitting at uh, was built in 1920, and we really have some very, very nice looking uh, state of the art type facilities. You know, one top stop shops for students to go, you know, go to the bookstore, get their Chromebooks repaired, um, you know, go see their counselors, have have some career counseling too. So that's that's uh, very, very neat. Um, we've also, our, our community is diverse and it's becoming more diverse and we're very happy about that. But what we need to do as educators and administrators is focus on um, diverse, uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity. And uh, we're focusing on that. We have a laser focus on that. And we're working very hard as administrators and as teachers to really do a better job of appreciating cultural backgrounds and how they influence what students are, are bringing to school every day. Finally, uh, we do have a world-class adult education program. Um, you know, again, it's been a focus for Ken Wallace, our superintendent, um, and a focus for our community. We have a we have an excellent person who handles adult education for us. Uh, we offer opportunities to surrounding districts, but that's really, you know, we are fully uh, of the belief that we can better serve our students by better serving, you know, being a learning community, not just for students, but also for our staff. What challenges are your students facing now? So I would say, and I, again, I'm going to come at this from a technology uh, lens. And so one of the things that we are really concerned about in terms of technology is student data. Um, and, you know, what we hear from, you know, and this is this isn't uh, just a, you know, a, a local school district thing, but it's national. Um, for example, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, Los Angeles Unified School District was breached, what, about a month ago now, and enlisted the help of the White House in terms of, A, recovering from that breach, but B, you know, helping beef up their, their uh, cybersecurity efforts to make sure that such breaches don't happen again in the future. So we really, from a technology standpoint, want to make sure that our student data is secure, and there's a host of of things that go along with that in terms of uh, security investment, A, but B, another thing is, you know, our kids have had Chromebooks for a long time, and there's a lot of districts that have been one-to-one -one for a long time. You know, we talk about our students as being digital natives, but what we need to really do is better engage students with technology. I mean, digital natives and being able to visit social media sites and go to TikTok and things like that, that's one thing, but what can we do that is productive with computers and really is helpful for our communities? And that's that's really something we need to focus on with technology. And we, we do a good job with that. I don't want to say that we don't, but on the other hand, I think as schools in general, we can do a much better job of engaging students with technology such that we're not using it strictly as, you know, a, a uh, means of entertainment or anything like that, but also as a learning tool. And we've had some discussions about that with our devices around here is how to, you know, help students understand that these devices are there for learning and not necessarily for uh, recreation, I guess, is, is a good way to put it. We certainly know that just because students are engaged doesn't necessarily they're engaged in a productive way. Uh, so I've certainly seen that as an educator throughout my career. Final question to you is, what do you wish you had to help more kids? So I think, you know, and again, I'm going to return to that thing about student data privacy. I mean, our students' identities are are very, very, they're an, I, I can't even begin to emphasize how important students' identities are in their data. Um, you know, in, in previous roles, I've thought, you know, we've thought that, you know, in some cases, students wouldn't know that their data has been stolen until they try to get a lease or until they're applying for college or they're trying to buy their first car with a loan. They wouldn't know that there's that they had lost their data and they'd lost their identities until something like that happens. So we need to do, I would say if we were going to put, you know, and again, coming at it from a technology standpoint, but we need to make investments in protecting student data and protecting our staff's data as well. Um, so that's one thing we can do. One thing that we're really trying to do here too 
is provide better customer service to our families. Um, we, from a technology standpoint, uh, families have to do all kinds of things with technology to basically, A, get their students even in the door in the first place uh, through registering, but then B, you know, follow and help and assist their students as they progress through our, our systems. We need to do a better job of making that very customer friendly. And, and I use that term customer intentionally. We really need to understand our role, not only as educators and not only as technology leaders in schools, but also as people that are there serving our community and making sure that, and you know, we all get that as educators, we also need to make sure that our families really feel that from us and that they understand that we are here for them. And, and to do that, we need to do, I, I, if I had more resources right now, and we're actually building towards this as we speak, but making it easier for our, our families to engage with our schools, um, you know, whether it's through communication, whether it's through going out into the community and, and registering students rather than, you know, making students come to schools. Um, you know, if it's a better way of helping uh, families track their students' progress as, as they move through schools. And actually, I found, you know, as a parent that my students were very, very aware of their progress as well. Um, but, you know, if we can build that pride in with families and with students, um, I think we do a better job of serving our community. So uh, these are things that we need to do um, to better engage our families. And I would also, I'd add that right now, what we do in schools is really focused on technology now. I mean, it gets to a point where most schools can't take attendance unless they have technology. Most teachers' classes get disrupted on a daily basis if the internet's not connecting or if the network's down. Um, so again, coming at it from a technology standpoint and how we can better serve our students and our staff and our families is really to provide very reliable technology. In some cases, we... Uh, you know, we do this kind of on a shoestring and it's really, you know, a tribute to technology leaders in education right now that we do the things that we can do. Um, but I think that we could, we could definitely use some more help there. So. Thanks, John. Thanks, John, for sharing. And we appreciate you being here for the kids. Thank you. My pleasure. Let's bring in Kathy Kajijian. From a communications perspective, Kathy, how does your school district work to demonstrate how you are here for the kids? Thanks, Earl. Hello, everyone. Um, in District 34 here in Glenview, being here for the kids means also being here for the families. Um, we have more than 60 languages spoken in the homes of our students. Um, it is beautiful diversity that we have in our community. Um, and we need to make sure that the families of our students who um, speak those other languages have a way to understand their child's academic experience and feel that they are a part of the school community. Um, so we use our communications tools to make sure that we have um, translation and interpretation services for these families and make it easy for them. So um, our website, of course, is ADA compliant and has translation tools. And we make sure we do a lot of um, parent education to make sure that they know how to use those tools on the website. We have a newsletter platform um, that also has translation tools. We just did um, we have interpreters, we have Spanish interpreters, translators on staff and great partnerships um, with interpreter translators for Korean and Mongolian, which are our other two big languages um, in District 34. Um, last night we had, or last week, we had a parent program um, on vaping education, um, current trends in vaping, which is an important topic um, in the health of our students these days. Um, and Zoom has a wonderful feature that allows interpreters to be live translating, interpreting um, the presenter, and parents can tune into that channel. So we make sure the presentation um, gets translated so they have a copy of the presentation that they can follow and they are listening in their native language as well. Um, and they can listen in that language on the recording. Um, 
but being here for the kids means making sure those families and making sure students feel that they belong, that students are seen for exactly who they are. One of our schools, Glen Grove, we are a preschool through eighth grade district, um, and we have schools preschool through second grade, third through fifth grade, and our middle school, sixth through eighth grade. Glen Grove School is one of our intermediate schools, um, third through fifth grade students. And they took our theme of we belong, I belong in District 34. That was our big theme last year. Um, and they really ran with it and created the Glen Grove Community Project. And I'm going to drop the link to that website to everyone in the chat. Um, Glen Grove's website is gg.glenview34.org. And you can click on the Glen Grove Community Project. And a group of staff members launched this project as a way for students and staff members, too, to be able to share their traditions, their cultures, their holidays, and other celebrations um, with the community and with each other. Um, and it has really taken off. They created it as kind of a Google Slides, Google Classroom um, program at first. And when I saw it, I said, we need to get this onto our website, which has those translation tools so everyone can access the stories that our families are telling. And they put out the call and students and families shared videos. They shared the resources that they have um, that allow people to learn about their culture and their customs. And the conversations that you hear in the classrooms and the hallways and at parent gatherings um, are about the connections that they make between cultures. Uh, so it's a really exciting way to show these students that they belong, that people care about um, where they come from and the language that they speak, and that they should be proud of that, because that is what makes them who they are, and we see that. Yeah, it, it speaks to the heart of the Here for the Kids campaign, which is, you know, talking and showing and sharing those stories, those powerful stories about the great things that are happening in your school and the school district. And these are the kids telling the stories themselves and Absolutely. their families. Yeah. So you mentioned kids. So what challenges are your kids facing now? Well, I'll say that it's a whole community challenge, but it certainly impacts the kids is that public discourse has become less and less civil. And, you know, the new pandemic of misinformation and disinformation and divisiveness um, has hit boardrooms. We have seen that across the country, but that impacts kids. Kids are watching. Kids are hearing those conversations. And even if they aren't, their teachers are. And that certainly doesn't do um, any good for effective teaching when teachers feel beaten and attacked publicly. Um, those same teachers that were heroes are being attacked. They're still heroes. They are doing incredible work. We heard from Rebecca the great work that teachers are doing. Um, I have countless examples as well. And so... Our challenge is to ensure that we are modeling civil discourse, that we are providing an opportunity for parents who, families, um, community members who want to speak up in a positive way to have the resources to do that and in any language. And you kind of answered my next question, which was, what do you wish you had to help more kids? Sounds like you already were doing some really powerful things in your district that are helping kids. Yeah, we, but we still want more understanding that differences are not divisiveness, that the differences in our communities are what makes our communities strong and great. And we need the parents and family members who understand and support 
what's happening in the schools and support public education um, to have a way to have a voice. And we do have opportunities through um, surveys and we use a tool called Thought Exchange that allows a community conversation. And when we put out a Thought Exchange, you do see the support for public schools and for what we're doing. Um, and we just need to do that more and better. Kathy, thank you for sharing and thanks to you and your communications colleagues across the country for helping us tell the story about the great things going on in our nation's public schools and for being here for the kids. Thank you. You're welcome, Ralph. Thank you. Let's bring in Laura Mitchell to hear a, a very important part of this conversation, and that's the, the family piece. Laura, thank you for being here. And talk a little bit about how your school district is working to demonstrate how you and your colleagues, your family members are here for the kids. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me and for the prior speakers, all of the above. I want it all. Um, put me at the buffet and I will take one of everything. Those are such important points. And we are doing a lot of those things. The ESSER funds, the federal funds that we got as a result of COVID allowed us to do a lot of things and fill in a lot of gaps, experiment with things we thought might work. Some did, some did not. So we're in the process of identifying those um, as that money starts to run out, figuring out which ones worked best for the, we got the most bang for the buck that we, and we should keep them and which ones are okay to let go of. And I think we're doing a, a fairly good job of, of doing that. Um, paying attention to student mental health, student um, well-being, that's a big topic for everybody, for adults and students right now. We're talking a lot more about that than we ever have before. It was a problem. It was a challenge before the pandemic. We had uh, some really serious numbers happening with uh, challenges for students that we weren't talking about. So that's great. We're still not talking enough about what happens when those aren't, aren't treated, the substance use prevention piece and, and where we go with the self-medicating and, and how that happens. And um, so, but we're getting there. At least here, we're listening, we're talking about it. Um, I'm talking about it, they're listening. <laughs> I talk a lot about it. That's kind of my shtick is the mental health and, and substance use prevention and uh, well-being. And I think we're doing a good job of trying to meet those needs. Um, they're a bit elusive with 163,000 students. It's impossible to meet all of them, <laughs> all of their needs with one solution, right? So there's a lot of, of um, piecemeal around that and the communication piece and realizing to get the information out. It's not just having those resources, it's letting people know that we have the resources and how to access them and making sure that they're accessible. So um, we also just completed an anti-racist audit. There is, uh, we have 151 languages in our county and that's a lot, that's a lot of diversity. And we want everyone to belong, to feel, to feel that belonging. That's Maslow, right? Number one, you got to belong, because if you don't, that leads to all those other things that that we were talking about, the mental health, the substance use, all of that part, um, the lo learning loss, not engaging, all of those things. So um, we're really looking at that report, the recommendations, and, and we have uh, leadership that is very, very set on making sure that we implement those solutions that have been identified and correct the uh, challenges that we have where we haven't been meeting those needs. Uh, we think we are in some cases, but we may not be. I think it was Rebecca that said, even though you you try to do something to do that, and even that may be making things worse and not better. So I think systemically looking at how we're doing different things uh, from the way we teach to the way we engage families, to the way we talk with each other in the schools, and making sure that we're getting the outcomes we expected. You've already mentioned a couple, but what challenges are your kids and I'll even say grandkids facing now? Yeah, I think um, a lot of them don't feel like they belong. The, the students are, are lost. They were disconnected for an extended period of time. We all were. And 
kept in our homes. We found Zoom. We found some silver linings and some ways to connect and, and things, but it was not the same. So having the opportunity to go back to school and reconnect has been very challenging. A lot of students um, didn't get the emotional growth and the maturity that they normally would have seen in those grades. And so now they're coming into ninth grade, for instance, as high school last year, and they were still sixth graders or seventh graders in, in maturity and in interactions and, and those kinds of things. And um, our teachers are getting the brunt of it, the community discord, the national discord that we've had um, it is coming into the classrooms. It's coming into the district. It's coming into the board of education meetings. And we really do have to be mindful that the kids are watching and that they're learning. They're not just watching, they're learning that this is how you do things. Um, and it's not, <laughs> it should not be how we do things. And that wears on their, their mental health. It wears on their sense of belonging and how they feel about their school and their teacher and their friends, their, their um, fellow students. Even, you know, it, whether it's their neighbor or in school, it's, it's bleeding over everywhere. And then that comes into the school and what happens in the schools to going home with them in the neighborhoods and we're seeing an increase in violence at home and at school. And uh, that is a real, real challenge. We've also lost uh, several students this calendar year. Um, from January to June of last year, we lost about a student a week, either to substance use or uh, death by suicide. That's not acceptable. We have to address that. Thank you for sharing those, those challenges. So in Montgomery County, Maryland, what do you wish you had to help more kids? Uh, well, we're working on it. One of, one of the biggest things I feel like is family engagement. And I don't just mean the parents or the guardians or the caregivers. We were having discussion about those differences and, and how even just which word you choose to use can exclude others from that. I'm a grandparent. And I'm very, very involved with the schools. My kids are grown, but I have a granddaughter in 10th grade. And I see the need. I see that I have uh, the opportunity to, to make some change. And so I try to do that. I, I get involved. And I think that from a school perspective, we really need to look at how we engage the entire community, whether it's businesses that have additional technology skills that they can consult with us on. That whether it's um, or help with, whether it's grandparents coming in to read or help people, students sound out those words, um, or if it's the communication piece. If you're involving them, you don't have to push out communications to them. That's a term we hear all the time. We've got to push it out. Well, what if you brought them in instead and they were in the school from the budget process at the school level, bring the student governments in, hear what's going on in the school. You want to know what the students need to ask them, ask the students. You want to know what the parents need to be more engaged, to be able to help their students? Ask us. We'll tell you because we know what we're missing and what we feel like. And the more we go away from the pandemic right now, the more we seem to be backsliding from all those silver linings we found during the pandemic not using the technology where it can track which assignments are due and or have and have not been turned in, things like that. That's a shame. We need to keep those benefits and, and find more. Laura, thank you for being involved in the PTA and bringing in families and for being here for the kids and sharing your experiences today. Thank I you. wanna bring in uh, the, actually the panel, Laura talked a little bit about communities. Communities need to be more involved. And I, I want to bring back in Rebecca, uh, our teacher on the panel. Rebecca, what help do you want from your community? I think one challenge that um, has been brought up a couple of times tonight is the, that civil discord. And um, as the local association president, I try to attend as many school board meetings as I can to help highlight some of the positives that I mentioned and to 
make the board and the community aware of those positive things that are happening. And I hear from a lot of families, I'm on a couple of different family um, social media groups who always reach out and express that they're, you know, they, they, they heard it on, you know, they were listening while they were making dinner or they um, were watching it on, on TV, the school board meeting and expressing that, um, that they appreciate it and that they know that, that these things are true. And I just feel like we need more people to take advantage of those public opportunities to generate a show of support for public schools. I, kind of feel like uh, at the beginning of the um, the pandemic when a lot of this, I feel like this discourse, discord really started um, to ramp up as far as public schools go around things like masking mandates and some of the protocols that were being implemented. I feel like I naively thought it would go away once um, the stresses of the pandemic started to um, be alleviated. And I don't see that. I feel like it has given more people an opportunity to stand up and um, say things that just plain aren't true about our public schools. And there's not enough, um, there aren't enough of people outside of, um, say, school staff who feel compelled or able or brave or um, whatever it might be to do exactly what this campaign is doing, which is to stand up and say, no, our schools are really working together as a school community with our community at large to make things um, the best they can be for uh, everyone involved in helping our kids do the best learning and growing they can. So uh, I'm not sure how to do that. I, and it does happen in pockets, but I, I appreciate the fact that this campaign exists to try to really um, have an organized approach to making sure that the, the hard work and all of the efforts and um, needs of our kids are really appreciated and and the positive um, light that we need to throw on it um, happens. Let's bring Kathy back in. From a communications standpoint, how can we all, all of us involved in this, do a better job of engaging uh, our community in this work? Yeah, I what Rebecca just said really resonated that, um, you know, not enough people are speaking up and um, we need to, as educational leaders, not be afraid of the conversations. I hear that, well, you know, we've, we've become afraid of those loud voices um, that really aren't the majority. They really aren't. They're the loudest, but they're not the majority of the community members that send their children to schools that pay taxes that fund our schools so don't be afraid to have those conversations and just look for ways to elevate the voice of those that support schools and you know again i talked about thought exchange um, and other survey tools if you do a survey make sure you're sharing the results um, and don't ask if you won't act when you take a survey of whether it's students, staff, or parents, and you put out the results, make sure you talk about what you're doing with those results, because that will encourage people to continue to share their opinions with you. And I want to quickly close out this community piece by bringing Don back in, because Don, uh, you talked about successes that you've had uh, engaging the community in your school district. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so, you know, again, I, I, our schools are, are pretty well supported in general. You know, we have we have three high schools that, you know, families are engaged. Um, you know, we did manage to get the community to get behind us in terms of making better learning space, spaces for our students. And that, you know, as Kathy could tell you, that's that's an effort. I mean, that takes the entire organization to really reach out to the families, reach out to community members and, and get them on board. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a campaign. And uh, successfully, actually, I've been in two districts that have done that recently, and it takes all of us. It really does. Um, and to really help the community help students and help support our learning uh, environments. And I think that that's, that's incredibly important. So it's really that, that full-on press 
from the organization to really uh, help the community to help us, I guess, and help our students. Let's now turn to the chat to see if we've had any questions that have come in during our uh, time together here. Charlotte, have any questions come in for the panel? Uh, yes, thanks for asking, Earl. Um, so actually, we have a couple. So here's one. Um, we often hear the importance of partnership between school districts and the larger community. So how how have our, our speakers, how have they fostered that partnership? Let's uh, start with Laura Mitchell on that question. Laura? Well, I think that um, it, it's a two, definitely a two-way street. We have to have parents asking to come in. We have to have parents willing to come in and, and guardians and caregivers. Um, I did it. I said parents. <laughs> but we, we have to have um, the outside community who wants to be involved. And the more we uh, discuss our schools in a negative light, the less willing they are to do that. So the schools also need to, uh, I think, be better at tooting their own horn. Mm -hmm. As was mentioned, we have to talk about what we're doing right. Teach, I don't know exactly when, I have a pretty good idea, but I don't know exactly when or why teacher became a bad word, but um, it has been under the spotlight and scrutiny for a few years now. And I think that we really need to turn the conversation. We have to be braver. We have to be bolder as non-teachers, as community members in saying, this is what's going right and recognizing that and touting that and sharing it. Uh, and inviting people in to see for themselves. If you want to know what's going on in your school, go see. It's a public building. Go see. Any other panelists want to uh, jump in on that question? Yeah, I'd like to share, you know, developing partnerships throughout your community can be so helpful in the long run. During the pandemic in our township, we had a township-wide task force that came together of um, school districts, municipalities, park districts, libraries, um, police, chamber of commerce, and we had regular meetings. They were weekly or more often, you know, throughout the pandemic, but they've continued. And those partnerships help us share stories, help us share resources. Um, and we rely on on those partnerships to continue to share our stories and bring in, um, as Laura said, um, don't push out, but bring in people to our schools. Okay, thank you. Charlotte, other questions? Uh, yes, yeah, something that's a, a little bit uh, in line with what the um, what our panelists just answered, but maybe digging a little bit deeper. So the question is, what can the community do better to both support schools and teachers and address false claims in the loud minority? Don, you, would you like to start with that? Well, that's that's a tough one. Uh, <laughs> So A, um, you know, social media outreach is important. Uh, Cozen, you know, the group of, of which I'm on the board has, has really helped lobby the social media companies to make sure that organizations and INSPR has been involved in this too, is to make sure that organizations can't impersonate us, you know, essentially make sure that, you know, when we're communicating, it's authoritatively us, you know? So, I mean, I think that's a part of it. So at least we can get the, get the truth out there, or at least get, you know, what we're doing out there and making sure that uh, we're getting information out there that's accurate and timely. Yeah. And I have one great example of um, debunking misinformation and disinformation. Um, the Grand Forks School District in North Dakota, if you visit their website, um, my colleague Tracy Jentz APR, who is their head of communications, created a rumor has it webpage mm -hmm. to put out when something is fact and when something is fiction. That's just such a great example of um, you know, making sure that the right information is there and being the trusted, making sure that the district, the schools are the trusted source of information. I want to hear people say, um, oh, 
Kathy Kajigian sent out that message, it must be true, or it's on the school or district website, I know that's a great source of information. Yeah, I think that transparency and sharing as much information as you can without you know, exposing any private information, but sharing as much as you can. And if, as uh, I think Kathy said, if you ask for information, do something with it and tell us what you did with it. Tell mm -hmm. us what the information showed you and what you did with it. Not just, oh yeah, we did this big study. We spent $2 million on a study and here are the results and here are their suggestions and then crickets. So I think that that is, because if people don't have real information, they'll make it up. Mm -hmm. So if you don't leave the void, there's nothing to fill. Absolutely. Transparency is very important. Charlotte, uh, we have time for one more question from the chat. Okay, sure. Just one quick one. Um, so we know that there are great assets within each of our communities. What are some additional ways that a school district or a school can help leverage all those great assets within a community? We'll open that to the group. Someone would like to take that? Well, I think you need a process to be able to have them in the schools. Obviously you need background checks. You need to make sure that our students are safe with who you're letting in the schools. But to have that process in place and make it as easy as possible, then you can, when someone says, I wanna come in and help, you can have them in there in a few days. If you have to invent that wheel every time or every school has to reinvent that wheel, we have 209 schools. We will have all kinds of wheels. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so have a, a process that you know, here's the entry point. Here's the website you go to if you want to go into a school and help. Here's, here are some of the ways you can help. I think creating more roles like a family and community engagement coordinator um, are going to become increasingly uh, vital to that effort. It's something that certainly traditionally uh, there was more at the classroom level, but I think as the you know discussion tonight has shown, there's much more of a need for the family to the community to become a support for um, the schools and for the schools to become a support for the community. And there has to be some level of real organization and making that part of our infrastructure in our public schools for that to be successful and be as meaningful as possible. As we close out here today, thanks to Rebecca Cole, Don Regelstein, Kathy Kajijian, and Laura Mitchell for sharing why they are here for the kids, what their school and school district is doing to demonstrate how they are here for the kids, the challenges their kids are facing now, and what they wish they had to help more kids. Thanks to everyone who participated in this. Thanks for joining us, taking time to be with us today and sharing personal stories. We hope that you will join us in Here for the Kids campaign by sharing your public education success story please visit learningfirst.org forward slash here for the kids for more information about the campaign and ideas about how you can show your support and be here for the kids. Thank you, Earl, for leading us through this discussion. It's been enlightening on so many levels and so much of it is about the fact that we have leaders such as this group who represent so many others who have a good idea of what the kids need, have, want to work with the community and are figuring out what the challenges are now and in the near future. Thank you all.